Michigan Out of Doors Online is brought to you in part by by Tri-County Logging. Experienced in sustainable forestry practices, Tri-County Logging can help you manage your property by keeping your woods healthy and generate income. Serving southern and mid-Michigan for nearly 50 years, tricountylogging.com. Well, everybody, welcome to Michigan Out of Doors, and thank you so much for joining us this week. Got a really cool show lined up for you. We're going to kick things off over on Saginaw Bay by doing a little bow fishing. Now, if you've never seen that before, it happens after dark. It's amazing what you can see in the water. You won't want to miss that. After that, Jordan Brown is going to take us below the water for some spear fishing. That's a very unique story. And then we're going to also stop in at a gun range and learn a little bit about the 351 Winchester caliber. So very cool show this week. Make sure you stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze Dancing on the pine forest floor The autumn colors catch your eyes Here come the crystal winter skies It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors What a beautiful day in the woods Someday our children all will see This is their finest legacy The wonder and the love of Michigan As the wind comes whispering through the trees, the sweet smell of nature's in the air, from the Great Lakes to the quiet stream, shining like a sportsman's dream, it's the love of Michigan we all share. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by, by Country Smokehouse, a sportsman's meat processor and Michigan destination since 1988, offers a variety of homemade smoked meats and Michigan-made products in-store and online. The Country Smokehouse features an outdoor barbecue and bar. Details at countrysmokehouse.com. By Angler Quest Pontoons. Angler Quest is a Michigan based company building boats designed for comfort and fishing functionality. For more information, anglerquestpontoons.com. By Green Mark Equipment. Green Mark Equipment is a John Deere dealership network in southwest Michigan and northern Indiana. Green Mark provides sales and services to farmers, commercial businesses, large property owners, and homeowners. Information about pricing and products available can be found online at greenmarkequipment.com. A week or so back found me on Saginaw Bay just before dark to meet up with Tom Miller and his crew to do some bow fishing. The bay is great for this and Tom told us how we would get started. So we're going to get out here, the first thing that we always do is check the wind direction, make sure that it's going to be coming from the shore side so we don't have big waves coming at us and swamping us off. Um, we look for clear water and then we make sure that if somebody doesn't know how to figure out what the fish is, we point them out and say you can shoot that fish, you can't shoot that fish. We want carp, gar, um, drum, shad, a handful of other ones. but. We'll kind of go over that as we're looking at him. Tom had originally contacted us to see if we would show his new invention, the arrow out. I said, well, let's see this thing in action, and here we were tonight. Well, this is designed to save your hands from wrapping them with line and losing arrows. All you do when your arrow is stuck in the bottom, just go on there, put a little pressure on, boom, locks on, pulls real hard. Really? Actually, this idea came to me on Saginaw Bay just last summer. We uh, were shooting a tournament out there. My buddy shot a harsh lock in the water. I was the one with the longest arms, so I got to take my shirt off, stick my head under water, <laughs> reach down and get it. And after about the third time that night of doing that, I said, you know, there's got to be a better way. Turns out there wasn't, so we came up with it. Joining us tonight was Tom's wife, Samantha, his brother, Tim, Nick Nation, and Dustin Carpenter. I asked Tom just how this all got started. I started, I don't know, probably about 10 years ago in a rowboat. had one guy rowing and another guy with a spotlight and me standing there with a bow. And it was real interesting. I had an old compound, I think it was a, maybe a darting, 70 pounds, blasting through fish. And it was just, I kind of uh, dove in headfirst after that. And we went from that to a 14 foot flat bottom boat to a big old ugly fiberglass boat. and. Then on to a 1648 aluminum boat, and we just kept on going. Hopefully we're done now. We'll see. <laughs> As we got the generators fired up, I asked Tom about the light setup he uses, and I didn't really realize just how much goes into setting them up properly. Pretty much 99% of all other bow fishing lights are floodlights, so they're pointing straight out. They're blinding all of the homeowners. They're making people angry. These are designed so that they're putting the light directly where you want them. On the fish, you actually end up with right around twice as many lumens hitting right where the fish are instead of losing into the sky, into the houses. 
Well, night was finally falling, and we could start to see better and better into the water, and it was time for a few arrows to start flying. Oh, I got away. Oh, there you go. Who did it? There it is. Good job. Double whammy. Yeah. <laughs> I asked Tom just what it is about bow fishing that he and so many enjoy. Combination of you've got the archery, the fish, being on the water. There's you don't have to be quiet. You don't have to sit still. You can take the whole group of friends out there, be loud, have a good time. Just kind of enjoying being out there on the water. Oh. Well, let's just say we had plenty of misses tonight, and this arrow out, well, it was huge at least a half a dozen times where we couldn't pull the arrow out with the rope attached to it, and at about 50 bucks an arrow, this thing was a lifesaver. <laughs> well, we had a lot of excuses tonight, which is part of the fun, and we were starting to find the fish as well. We come up with all sorts of excuses for it. <laughs> is it with gar pretty good to eat? Gar very good to eat, yeah. You can take a pair of tin snips, snip all the way down the middle of their back, open it up, and there's two pure white boneless fillets that you can take out of there. You can grill them, you can chunk them up and deep fry them, make nuggets, they're pretty good. The gar are pretty good to eat and most of the other fish are used for fertilizer and in the big tournaments, coordinators actually partner with local farmers to take the fish for the farm fields. We even found one of the elusive goldfish tonight, but he was pretty safe. How many times can we this? Go back around, this again. He's right there still. Go for four. <laughs> it's pretty impressive that we had six people on this boat all up front, and for the most part, we had plenty of room. Tim did a lot to this boat to set it up for bow fishing. So we have uh, started with a completely bare hull. We flipped it over, we slicked the bottom, we put a wrap on it, we installed an extended flush deck, uh, added compartments, had sea deck installed, nice foam flooring, uh, added generator rack, had a center console built, installed that, did wiring, there's probably a mile worth of wire inside of it. Uh, yeah, it just goes on and on. We built custom housings. Actually, we're getting ready to start selling these housings. Um, we have eight 400 watt HPS housings on there. After doing the math on how many lumens we had going tonight, we had roughly half a million. It was pretty impressive to say the least. It was a very fun night. Hey! Bow fishing has become more and more popular and many are hardcore like Tom and his buddies tonight, but you can start like he did with a Q-beam and a rowboat, but be careful, the sport is pretty addictive. Anytime you can go out with a bunch of friends and take advantage of a night like this with calm conditions, lots of fish, and to see all that you can see under the water, well, you start to see why this is so much fun. So if you see a few folks on the water late at night with a rig that looks like a small spaceship, you now know it's just some crazy folks chasing fish with a bow and arrow. Just another example of the great variety of outdoor pursuits here in Michigan's Out of Doors.
Hi, I'm Jordan Brown, and for our next segment on this week's show, we're going to switch gears just a little bit. We're going to go from bow fishing over on the east side of the state to spear fishing in northern Michigan. So starting out, I think I started just like everybody else did as far as an angler would. Uh, you know, grandpa, uncle, dad, all just take me fishing, you know, just get us out on the lake, get a, get, you know, get a, get a ride in their hands. And uh, you know, just over the years, uh, I started, when you get into high school, I started swimming and I became a lifeguard. And so I was very water orientated through a lot of my, you know, teens and into my early 20s. And, uh, I used to come out here and just jump in the water and just swim around the rocks because I enjoyed it so much. I didn't, it was just fun, you know, I just enjoyed it. Like still, watching, watching the fish interact, fish coming up to you, it was just what I did and I liked doing it. And then my brother Nathan, he, the Michigan Spearfish Association held a tournament in Traverse Bay uh, two summers ago and he posted pictures on Facebook and I was like, Bro, why didn't you invite me? You know I love swimming in the water. I didn't know he could spear fish in Michigan. I had no idea that that was a thing. When the, when the regulations say spear, I didn't think. I thought hand propelled spear. So I was like, wait, this is a thing? And I was like, take me out. So he took me with his buddy James to Muskegon. And I got in that water and it was, a, it was essentially like bow hunting, but we were underwater and it was for fish. It was like, I love bow hunting, I love fishing, and you put them together, and then you get to see everything, you're like, wow, this is amazing. And so before I knew it, I invested a bunch of money in all this gear, and last year I just got in and just fell in love with it, you know. Today the plan was to work our way around the break wall looking for fish. A storm system had passed through a few hours before we hit the water and had made the visibility pretty low, but we decided to give it a try anyway. Although some people do use scuba gear when spearfishing, John prefers to free dive and walk me through what kind of equipment you need to spearfish this way and to do it safely. You can do, um, you can use scuba gear or you can just use regular snorkeling gear or free dive gear. Um, you don't need a ton of this just to get started. Uh, I use this because I start earlier and I go later. Um, so, you know, you get a nice wetsuit like this to keep yourself warm, especially in the Great Lakes, Lake Huron, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan are all gonna be cold most of June and into, you know, starting into July and August, they'll get warm. But after that, you know, you can use, you can just go in swim shorts and, you know, a mask and fins. But I, I invest a little bit more myself just cause I, I do it more often and I enjoy it more. So you get a nice wetsuit, some booties, keep your feet and hands warm, uh, a nice mask that you can use and then a snorkel you need a weight belt just to counteract the buoyancy of the wetsuit. Um, this is just a stringer, essentially, that you can just clip onto your weight belt just so you don't have to go back to your dive raft every time. Um, always important to have a very sharp dive knife because you will encounter anchor lines and braided line and, and stuff like that on rocks. And if you ever get tangled in it, you're going to need a way to free yourself. So a sharp, a sharp knife is very important. With a spear gun, it's pretty, much, it's pretty simple. All you're going to have here is a... Uh, a trigger mechanism and then you're going to have a shaft right and this shaft is attached to a lanyard uh, which according to the Michigan regulations can't be more than 20 feet long but most of the time from back of the gun to the end of the spear is like 15 feet um, and then you'll have two or one band however you prefer and then these are what you actually will load physically onto the spear shaft and that's what will propel it so that's when they say rubber propelled, that's what they mean in the regulations. This is the rubber propelled propulsion. Well, we were having a tough time finding fish, but on the plus side, the guys were able to remove some trash from the area. Although spear fishing may sound easy, in reality, it can be quite difficult. Thankfully, John had captured some footage of his own recently and was able to share it with us to showcase what it looks like when things go well.
In addition to spearfishing for fun, John has also been involved in trying to change the current regulations to make more species available to those who spearfish on the Great Lakes. See, in April of last year, uh, before the season started, I went to the Natural Resource Commission and gave a statement about underwater spearfishing and the lack of uh, species availability for table-worthy game fish, if you will. And I made the point that the resource is protected through regulations by size and bag limits. I can take five walleye, 15 inches or above, has a hook and line angler, but I'm not allowed to do that with a spear, with a spear gun. And I thought that was a little unfair, being that I buy a license just like everybody else. Commission told me to speak with the Fishers Division. So I emailed Chief Dexter's secretary and um, I was able to get a meeting with them and we talked about it and I showed them videos and what we do and how we do it. And uh, they agreed and so I put uh, some new regulations, a draft if you will, um, to update our current regulations and uh, they liked it and they agreed with it and so we are we were moving forward to get that in front of the warm and cold water steering committees to review that and then get that in front of the public and other groups to make sure that they are congruent with it as well. So we are moving forward with that, but that's, you know, 22, 23 probably if, and that's even if it gets approved, if they agree with us. That would be uh, lake trout, walleye, and northern pike on all of the Great Lakes no inland lakes and this is a separate season from potentially from end of April until the end of September. Despite the tough fishing conditions it was still a fun day on the water and it's always nice to learn about the different ways people enjoy the outdoors. Special thanks to John for letting me tag along on a day of spear fishing here in northern Michigan. Well, we're going to take a break from the water now and head to the gun range. And if you ever get a chance to sit down with a guy who literally wrote the book on a specific caliber, I would highly recommend it. Spending time at a gun range is always fun, but when you get to sit down with Leonard Spicane at a gun range, well, it's even better. Leonard contacted me and I jumped at the chance to learn about a gun and a caliber I knew little about, the 351 Winchester. Well, it all started when I was 14 years old. Uh, I was going to start deer hunting with my father and I wanted a deer rifle, so I sold my Lionel electric train and saved the money from my paper route and bought the 351. And I bought it brand new at Peter's Gun Shop in Saginaw, Michigan in 1954, in February of 1954, actually. Uh, the reason I bought a 351 was I liked the semi-automatic uh, operation of the rifle, uh, the low recoil. I was a skinny kid and didn't want to uh, have a high recoiling rifle, so I, uh, and when I, the main thing was I picked up that rifle, and as a 14 year old, that rifle fit me perfectly. It was just like I put on a glove, and any, any rifleman knows what I'm talking about. And the same with shotguns, I mean, you, you'll find a shotgun that, or a rifle that'll fit you when you, first time you put it to your shoulder, this is the one for me. And that's what it was with the 351, and I bought it, brand new. It cost $140 in 1954, which was, very expensive in 1954, and it was $20 more than the Winchester Model 70 bolt action rifle. That was $120 at that time. So it was the most expensive of their rifles uh, in, the, in the standard line. Well, this gun is very unique, and being one of the first semi-auto rifles, it was great to learn about this old, but still very useful, hunting firearm. The mechanism in the 351 is extremely simple. This is the charging handle here. This opens the breech and puts a round in the chamber. I don't have a round in it now because the magazine is out. Here's the safety. And it is a, a blowback weapon. It's not gas operated. It's fired simply by uh, the energy of the cartridge. Uh, the timing of it is that the breech block remains closed until the bullet is out of the barrel. Because the inertial block, which is underneath the forearm, 
is timed so that it won't start the rearward action until the bullet is out of the barrel. Hmm. So you're not losing any power with the cartridge. The weight of the rifle is, is seven and a half pounds, which is a little heavy for a short rifle, but that's because of the inertia block under the forearm. But what, with the weight, you also get the trade-off that the recoil is negligible. For a woman, for a boy, or for a man my size, um, there's almost, it's very little recoil to the rifle, even though it is semi-automatic. So you have a very fast second shot capability. Uh, the rifle with the 10-shot magazine was used by the FBI, uh, different uh, Ohio Highway Patrol, uh, the federal prison system. It was very popular with law enforcement because of its 10-shot capability and its power and its simplicity. So when you think back in 1907, when rifles were primarily lever action, that you have a semi-automatic firearm with a 10-shot capability with a power equaling that of the then loaded 3030 cartridge, that's a tremendous amount of firepower. And law enforcement picked up on this quickly. Now one knock on guns along these lines is their accuracy. But like most rumors you hear, it's always best to talk to folks that actually know what they're talking about. The accuracy of it, uh, the people that wrote about the 351 had never fired one. They had never hunted with one. The accuracy is excellent. At 50 yards, and I'm 75 years old, at 50 yards, I can group them about like that with open sights. So I bought a rifle that had been tapped, drilled and tapped for a scope to experiment to see how well this, this rifle would actu ac actually shoot because I didn't want to tap into this receiver and, and mount a scope on it because the gun is virtually a, uh, a mint condition gun, my original one. So I, I did buy, a, um, and I cover this in my book, I, I bought a, a, a 351 that had been tapped in the top, the stock had been cut, and it really had no collector's value, or very little collector's value. Mounted a three to nine scope on it, and I shot it at 100 yards to see what it would do. Well, <laughs> there was one group of Remington factory ammunition, and if I remember it in the book, but it's, it, it is there, it shot to within an inch and three quarter group at 100 yards. And I had the lot of the ammunition listed in there. I mean, that, some bolt action rifles won't do that out of the box. So it is not an inaccurate round. It's for hunting purposes, it's entirely accurate. Uh, most of the averages ran around two and a quarter. So it'll shoot more accurately than most people can hold it. Sitting with Leonard was a ton of fun. And if you want more info on this caliber, his book has everything you'd ever want to know. It was a great afternoon learning about this unique caliber from a great Michigan sportsman. Well, hey everybody, thank you so much for watching Michigan Out of Doors this week. And if you missed part of this week's show or maybe last week's show, you can always check us out online. You can check us out on our website. We're also on most of the social media platforms if you want to see what we're doing on an up-to-date basis. And if you're ever on YouTube, you can subscribe to our Michigan Out of Doors television channel there and get an email every time we post something new. Lots of good stuff coming over the next several weeks here in Michigan Out of Doors. There is a lot of good fishing happening all around our state. And if we don't see it in the woods or on the water, hopefully we'll see it right back here next week on your PBS station. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by. Do you dream of somewhere bigger than your backyard? You can get there with Greenstone. Whether you want to hunt, fish, hike, or just watch the sunset, we're ready to help you own your place in the great outdoors. To learn more, visit GreenstoneFCS.com. DTE believes to lead, we have to do what's right. So we're tripling renewables and cutting carbon emissions in half over the next 10 years. DTE. Michigan's hunters and anglers are essential partners to the health of the state's wildlife and habitats. The Michigan Wildlife Council is dedicated to ensuring our hunting and fishing heritage and Michigan's natural resources are preserved for future generations. Closed captioning provided by Marvo Mineral, makers of Lucky Buck, deer management products including minerals to supplement deer diets year-round to improve health and antler growth. When I want to fire State. I am a Michigan man. Changing seasons paint the scene like rainbow trout in a hidden 
Christmas tree. The white-tailed deer in the tall pine trees. I am a Michigan man. I am, I am a Michigan man. Ask where I'm from and I'll show you my hands. Lord above, I love this land. I am a Michigan man. From the Keweenaw down to St. Joe, Calamus, East to Monroe. St. Marie and back again I am a Michigan man I am, I am a Michigan man That's where I'm from And I'll show you my hands Lord above 